This episode of Epicenter Bitcoin is brought to you by Ledger, makers of the Ledger Nano hardware wallet. Have peace of mind in knowing your private keys are protected by industry standard physical security. Go to ledgerwallet.com to learn more and use the offer code EB09 at checkout to get 10% off your first order. And by Voltoro.com, the gold to Bitcoin exchange. Trade gold to Bitcoin instantly and securely starting at just one milligram. Go to Voltoro.com to deposit some Bitcoin and start trading today. Hi, welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Brian Fabian Crane. Uh, we're here today with Simon Dixon. Many of you will have heard of Simon Dixon. He is the author of a book called Bank to the Future. He also is the founder of banktothefuture.com, which is a sort of an alternative financial service company that it likes to do things very differently. And he is the fund manager of Bitcoin Capital, which is associated with that. So we're excited to have him on here. He's, he's, been, uh, he's been doing some important projects, actually, uh, also in the context of this podcast, because uh, our, one of our sponsors is Shapeshift, and uh, they've, they've done, they've raised some funds through Simon and his enterprises as well, just recently. So uh, Simon, thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. Delighted to be here. So give us a little bit of background. How did you, first of all, get interested and involved in uh, finance, the world of finance and where did Bitcoin come in here? Uh, so, well, I, I was working in investment banking. Um, I worked in corporate finance, floating companies on stock markets as part of the team. And I did a couple of years as a trader, a market maker. Um, and um, I left in 2006 um, to start because I was really interested in sustainable finance, sustainable banking, um, and generally just running a, a business in general. Um, and uh, when I, I started, um, I started the first draft of, a, of a, the book called Bank to the Future at that point. And this is pre-Bitcoin, pre-crowdfunding. These concepts didn't exist then. And it was purely on how to drive a, fin a sustainable financial system. And some of the economic truths that um, I wasn't taught at university when I when I did my economics masters and things like that. Um, so that that was really my first introduction. Now, as um, as I wrote a couple more drafts of that book, um, Bitcoin came along, and and Bitcoin actually uh, bottom up solved some of the problems that top down I was saying need to be reformed by the government. Um, and so that was my first introduction, and uh, I was invited to the first Bitcoin conference in Prague. Um, and uh, I spoke there with a gentleman called Max Kaiser, who, who um, runs, a, runs a show that talks about Bitcoin a lot. Um, and uh, I've been hooked ever since. Actually, I was quite skeptical to begin with. I just went there to really um, discuss the book and, and some of the, th uh, the things we were talking about. But it turns out that a lot of the properties of Bitcoin um, solve some of the major problems in the financial system, um, which we can go in more detail later. Yeah. So, what are the most? Uh, what are these problems that you saw Bitcoin solving? Um, so, well, the, the book is a long version of of solving, um, discussing how you solve three problems, um, and the problems are as follows. Um, the reason that we're in, you know, we're we're in the financial problems we are is because we're. We're trapped in a multi-decade Ponzi scheme, as it were, where in order to have an economy, you have to have more debt. Um, and that the reason for that is simply because money is debt. Um, and so um, when, in order to have a growing and stimulating economy, you have to have governments take on more debt, you have to have individuals take on more debt, you have to have corporations take on more debt, and then you get growth. Um, and that's simply because economics... Um, has made an incorrect assumption, and that assumption is that banks are intermediaries between borrowers and lenders, which is just not true. Um, there's three properties that I talked about in the book that need to be solved. The first is, when you deposit your money with a bank, they become the legal owner of your money. Um, and so the people in Greece at the moment have experienced what happens when banks take your deposits. And in Cyprus, they experience what happens when they take their deposits. And every other country is about to experience what happens when banks take your deposits. <clears throat> the second property that needs to be solved is that when banks become the legal owner of your money, they can spend it as they wish. 
Um, so what tends to happen is they spend it on things which help their shareholders and their bottom line, which aren't good for the economy. So uh, banks were originally around to you know, make loans for businesses. Businesses could then produce something. They create some jobs and they could repay the loan um, and it produced some value in society. What's evolved is that it's, the loans have always moved to the least risky um, and the most profitable things to do. The most profitable things to do is financial speculation, which adds no value. A problem in Bitcoin, financial speculation adds very little value um, to the economy. And the second thing is it always goes for the least risky asset class, which is always property. Um, so the only reason that property prices continually increase is because it's banks' favorite asset class. Um, and therefore, you know, take an economy like the UK, which I know well, 40% of all the, the money that's yours that's spent goes to financial speculation. The other 40% goes to pushing up property prices. And only about 13% of the money that's created by banks um, goes to anything productive that creates jobs. And so, which wouldn't be a problem if it wasn't for the third, the third pro um, problem, which is that banks are actually the creators of money. Um, so people think economics assumes that a bank is an intermediary between a borrower and a lender. That's not actually true. A bank is actually the creator of the money supply. So whenever you have a positive balance in your online banking, um, that's simply somebody else's debt, and they created that money into existence at point of issuing a loan. And so 97% of every penny in the economy is created that way which means that the only way to drive sustainability if you want an economy to grow is you have to have more debt. If you want less debt, then you have to have a depression. And that's why we have boom, bust, boom, bust, boom, bust. It's just simple economics that the science of economics has forgotten or not incorporated into their models. Um, and so all of my focus at the time was how do you reform that top down? What implement, what changes need to happen to make it illegal for banks to create money, to make it so people own their own money, and to make it so that money is directed in um, the interest of the economy rather than just the interest of the bank's balance sheet. Um, and that's what the original book was about. And I hope this kind of segues into why Bitcoin is interesting, because when I first saw Bitcoin, I realized, hey, Everybody owns their own money, so my money is stored on my phone, my iPad, my laptop, wherever it is, um, in a cold storage or at a bank, if we wish. Um, the money is directed person to person, so the way that the money flows is actually a reflection of society. Um, and thirdly, Satoshi Nakamoto created an ingenious way of money being created, which is that the profits of money creation are distributed among the miners and the people that are actually adding value to the network and providing it security. So if you think about it, money can only be created in a few ways. Either governments create it, which is how notes are created. So the way that notes are created is um, the way a £10 note in the UK, it costs 3p to create and £9.97 is profit for the government. So you sell a £10 note to a bank, bank gives you £10, and that profit goes to tax revenues and it reduces the amount that consumers need to pay in tax. It's scenerage, it's how, um, it's how governments make money out of money creation. But that's only 3% of money. So when people talk about governments printing money like crazy, it's a lie, it's insignificant compared to banks created money. Why do you think that this has gone, uh, as you say, un untalked about by, uh, by economists and uh, economic theory? Um, well, the first thing is that it's not untalked about anymore. So the Bank of England, for the first time in its 360-odd year history, just released a video for the first time explaining how money is created. Um, and that's as a result, I believe, of Bitcoin, where people are questioning um, the roots of money more than we've ever seen before, and the financial crisis and a lot of circumstances. But in my experience, um, firstly, it's, it's, it's pure ignorance. So, you know... Um, a not-for-profit organization did a survey on all the MPs. I talk about the UK because I was there for so long. I don't live there anymore. But um, And of the 640-odd MPs, only four of them knew how money was created. Um, they thought that they had all control over it, or the Bank of England did, or whatever, the central bank. Um, and so there's, there's, there's a lot of ignorance there. And the two reasons, really. Firstly, 
the academic institution um, simply made that assumption that banks are intermediaries between borrowers and lenders and created economic theories called multiplier effects and all sorts of stuff. Um, and those theories have gone through to build the foundation of all economic science and economic thought. And all those models that we use to build, to, to, to use our monetary policy, our fiscal policies and build our economy are built based upon these outdated concepts. Um, and economists have been very resistant towards um, uh, accepting that, there's, that money is important in their economic models, how money is created, which is the foundation of all the models, really. Um, so there's that. And uh, there are economists out there, you know, doing some great work on this. Yeah, it's, it's interesting how you mentioned that because I, I said the economics as an undergrad and I did a master's in economics and philosophy. So I, I spend a lot of time looking at sort of economic theory and where does it come from? How does it work? Uh, I, I, always, I focus on microeconomics, so decision making and utility theory, rational choice theory. But it's similar there. I mean, the, 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 the theories underlying economics, they're just disproven, right? There are countless experiments showing that people do not act this way and people do not make decisions this way. So it's interesting because you have this whole big science and research and models all based on something that is just clearly wrong. And it's not really clear what the implications are for you know, all the things built on top, but it's certainly not a good thing when the things underlying it just is, is wrong. And kind of the, the main difference is that in microeconomics, it's built upon a theory of utility maximization, that we all try to maximize our utility and we use equations in everyday life to figure out whether we take an action or don't take an action. Um, but luckily, those theories are not really used in the, by the corporations or by businesses. But on a macro scale, <clears throat> the assumption of how money is created, which is incorrect on most models, um, is used to actually run our entire economy. It's how we determine our monetary policy, and it's actually whether we decide to bail out a bank or not based upon um, these actual theories. So it affects all of us in a major, major way. So economics has got a lot to answer for. Now, can we extrapolate here and perhaps assume that this is not just a problem with banking, but that it, 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 it expands and it actually is a problem with capitalism, perhaps? I would disagree totally. Um, I believe the, the financial crisis was a banking problem. It wasn't a capitalism problem. Um, I, I, capitalism, in my opinion, is, is not the crisis. Yes, there's problems with it. I believe it's one of the best ways of organizing um, structures. I think that, you know, um, it, yeah, the, the problem right now is that the, the capitalism is built upon an unsustainable banking system where the petrol, the fuel of capitalism is money. And money is built upon a process whereby it, in order for it to be created, it has to be created as debt. And therefore, that completely skews where money is allocated, who can access capital, um, and the size of certain organizations that have access to capital. So I believe that we have a banking problem, and that then leads to a corporation problem because corporations have access to finance that the small to medium-sized enterprises don't have access to, and therefore you get skewing of the economy. And uh, we've never had capitalism to actually test. Now, if you look at countries like Iceland right now, they are testing capitalism in its true extent. Um, they've sent the bankers to prison. They've sued them for counterfeiting their money supply when they issue loans. Um, and they're looking at cryptocurrencies as a foundation for their economy. Um, and, you know, they can do that on a scale of 160,000 people or whatever the population of Iceland is. Um, and it's one of the most innovative um, places in the world. And I believe you're going to see a real example, a first case study of capitalism um, and what it can actually produce. And then we can decide whether capitalism is a problem or not. You know, we'll talk about Bitcoin in a second. But assuming Bitcoin wasn't here, do you see some ways of changing that? Uh, personally, I'm from, I'm from Switzerland originally, so uh, there's actually a referendum right now that uh, wants to uh, prevent banks from creating money. I don't know if you're aware of that, but do you see some ways that the government would change or the financial system would change uh, from within or maybe because of a, a crash or if, if we have a huge depression that then some change would come? 
Yeah, um, the only the only way you will ever get the government to change um, is a complete meltdown. They will they have no appetite to change prior to any kind of uh, meltdown. Um, unfortunately, necessity is the the mother of all invention. Um, banking and government are completely entrenched, um, and no, you, you, all you've seen, and we've already we've already seen an example of meltdown with um, post the subprime crisis, um, and we saw exactly what they will do. They'll create another central bank, which um, puts together more control. Um, they'll look at more control currencies, and it will always be issued as debt. Um, and then all they do is they kick the can down the road a little bit further, and they create projects like quantitative easing, which is a new form of creating money. And what quantitative easing did is it said, well, let's allow the Bank of England to create money as debt um, and will allow the large corporations to borrow money at virtually 0% interest. And then what they did with that money is they ended up buying back their stocks, which created a property, um, not a property market bubble, um, a stock bubble. market bubble, yeah. um, a bond market bubble. And then the the richest people, which just redistributes money to, then use that to buy more property, which then re-stimulated the property market. So they chose the exact cause of the problem as the solution to the problem. And I believe they will do that forever um, because the brave person that goes into government and tries to exercise some of the power, which they totally have, um, to create money without issuing debt um, would be met with such massive, ginormous resistance. Um, and that's what we're seeing. So it just creates a brave case study like Iceland to stand up and do it. Let's take a short break so I can take you to Paris. I dropped into La Maison du Bitcoin, the house of Bitcoin, in the heart of Silicon Sentier, home to many startups, including Ledger. And I spoke with Eric Larchevêque, Ledger's CEO, about what we can expect in the coming months. A lot of our customers are asking for solutions compatible with uh, mobile uh, using uh, NFC or Bluetooth, and we are working on that. In September, we plan to release the Ledger Unplugged, which is a Java card uh, NFC compatible. At the end of the year, we will release the Ledger Oddity, uh, which is a hardware wallet with a screen, Bluetooth, uh, NFC, and the keyboard. And also in September, November, we are going to release the Ledger HSM for enterprises. And finally, the Ledger Trustlet, which runs in the trusted execution environment, uh, is uh, almost available now in uh, beta for uh, Mycelium and um, uh, Green Address, and which will be released hopefully uh, also in September. In the future, we really see ourselves as the leading company in securing all the Bitcoin solutions. Uh, for customers, but also for enterprises. We want to be the Cisco of uh, the Bitcoin. So definitely look forward to exciting and innovative new Ledger products to be released in the coming months. In the meantime, you can always count on the Ledger Nano to keep your Bitcoin safe. So don't delay in getting a secure setup today. Go to ledgerwallet.com and use the offer code EB09 to get 10% off your first order. And that offer code is valid until September 30th of 2015. We'd like to thank Ledger for their continued support of Epicenter Bitcoin. Before you mentioned, Simon, uh, the case of, you know, deposits, when you give your money to the bank, it's, it's actually the bank's money. And many will remember in Cyprus, right, when things went down in the end, uh, some of the money that people had in the bank, I think above a certain amount, was just basically taken, stolen. Uh, and I think we can expect something similar, probably worse to happen in Greece. Um, but you mentioned people are going to be experienced that all around the world. What do you think? Where is this going? What can we expect? Um, the way, if you, if you model out the economics of our existing system, you only get a few results. The, the results that you have is a larger divide between rich and poor. You have larger consolidation of assets between ultra-wealthy connected people and ultra-wealthy connected institutions. And each with each bailout, you move the bar in terms of the debt to the most indebted people. Um, you redistribute the debt to the taxpayer and that increases the rich-poor divide in its infancy. But eventually, there comes a point 
where people will no longer lend to government because they don't have, you know, they w- they just won't do it because of the interest rates um, that, you know, um, that come in the bond markets to that country. Um, and that's, it's when, when people will no longer, because what happens is individuals need bailing out. And so the government comes up with a scheme to allow you to buy your house, get you further into debt. But eventually they can't repay their interest because their mortgage becomes greater than their income. And so when wages are going down and their, in, and their mortgage is going up, that's just skewing money towards the banking system. Eventually, people can't afford it. So the banking system has some kind of collapse and correction. And because all money is created by a bank and the bank is the economy, the government then bail it out and the government then go to a central bank and the central bank then bail out the government through quantitative easing or whatever it is. But eventually, the financial engineering ends. And when that is, I've got no idea and how much more financial engineering they have. Um, But eventually it does end because you can't And why why does it end? Why can't the central bank keep doing that? Um, Because you can't taper a Ponzi scheme. Um, the, 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 The money, the assets underneath this have to come from somewhere at some point. And there's only so poor you can make people. There's only so much debt you can get people in. Um, there comes a point when people just default on their debt. And once everyone defaults on their debt, the, the, the entire system collapses. Today's magic word is crash. C-R-A-S-H. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener reward. Let's dive a little bit more into that, I think, before we move on to Bitcoin. So, because actually we haven't talked about the euro crisis on here. We, we don't talk a lot about sort of economics and the financial situation because, you know, we really focus on, on Bitcoin, on the technology, on where this is all is going. But I think it's interesting w- with you on here to spend a little bit of time on that. So you said, you know, you don't know when things are going to go wrong, but what do you expect? Because... Because I was, I remember in 2007, 2008, I was reading uh, about this all the time, right? There, there's a blog that I love, and I, perhaps you know it as well, and I can highly recommend anybody interested, which is called Naked Capitalism. And uh, the person is absolutely brilliant uh, in that she really, really understands a lot of it. And she's been writing extensively about the Greek situation as well. Um, so I was reading constantly then, and, and I was sort of always expecting, oh, that the, obviously this wasn't solved, right? The, the, but cost of financial crisis wasn't solved, right? It was just sort of tapered and said, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll push it further down. And I was like, oh, this is going to come back soon. And, and it hasn't, right? It's sort of, it, we're, we're quite a few years down. So do you think now is a time when, for example, in the EU, in the euro, things are starting to unravel? Things are starting to unravel. They've got a lot more tapering to do. So what you're seeing in Europe is um, the consolidation of a group of countries whose economics are very different, who all need their own currencies, um, whose interest rates and monetary policy for one country does not suit the country, the interest rates and monetary policy for another country. Um, using the central banking system on a grand scale through the European Central Bank, which is essentially Germany. Um, And if you look at the the charts, essentially it's just been a massive redistribution of wealth from the smaller countries in Europe to Germany. Um, And that's essentially what's happened with the European experiment. And so now you're seeing Greece fight with Germany, Germany as the, the banker, as it were, um, fighting and, um, you know, uh, the, with, with Greece. And Greek just, they just need to write off the debt, um, crash the bond markets. The pensioners are going to get hurt, unfortunately, because they're the ones whose money the banks are investing um, and the asset managers are investing. Um, and they need to rebuild their own economy and they need to rethink it from scratch. They don't need to build the same mistake again and they can become the most financially innovative place in the world much like we're seeing in iceland okay let's move on to bitcoin where where does where does that come in so we 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 spent some time talking about government and macro and and top down and things that are quite scary for for people to consider 
On the flip side, we've got one of the most exciting times in history. Um, and the reason today is so exciting is because a series of trends have all come together, whether that be social media, whether that be the internet, whether that be decentralized technology. Um, it's really, really exciting times in the entrepreneurial space. So bottom up, entrepreneurs are creating um, amazing things because they're not just sitting back. Um, and Bitcoin to me was, um, you know, we, we call it epicenter Bitcoin. It was the epicenter of financial innovation <laughs> for me. Um, it was something that I could never have dreamed of being created. Um, and it got created and it worked. And it's now become the largest supercomputer in the world on a scale we've never seen before. Um, and it's just completely bucked the trend. So, you know, it, it, it's just such an exciting financial innovation to now say that, yes, there's a lot wrong with Bitcoin. There's a lot strange about Bitcoin. There's a lot that many people don't understand and can't use. <clears throat> but we now have the rails to build financial innovation completely outside of the existing financial system so that you know, people in Greece, if only they were watching this podcast, they would have had their Bitcoins. They'd be exchanging them for gold. They'd be using them on their Bitcoin debit card. Um, they'd be sending them abroad. They'd, they'd have freedom, as it were. Um, yes, they you know, have to accept some kind of volatility and lots of the things. But remember, the thing with Bitcoin is that now we have programmable money. A service like BitReserve can come along and take out volatility uh, from the equation. Other entrepreneurs are coming along. So what I love about Bitcoin is that you don't have to lobby a government and persuade massive vested interest uh, to change things because it's being changed anyway at lightning speed. Um, and, you know, applications are just being built. So whenever someone comes to us with a problem about what Bitcoin is, you can come along and you can find someone that's trying to solve that problem, interview them on this podcast, a community gets built around it, and the technology is built, is rolled out, and the problem solved. So every problem um, that you can think of is being solved one step at a time, um, which is just is just such an incredible, innovative environment um, and something so exciting. So, so if we project this out, and let's say we're optimistic and things go right, and Bitcoin doesn't run into serious problems, etc., where do you see this going? I see a serious integration between the traditional financial system and the cryptocurrency, whatever we want to call it, blockchain ecosystem. Um, we're already seeing that. Um, fortunately, the traditional system is on a path to however long it takes, um, there is an implosion. And we're going to see that in, on a scale because it's just going to get bigger with each crisis, um, which means that now, rather than everyone having to accept um, that their wealth might be wiped out at any point, they can start hedging their financial system. They can start hedging their personal portfolios. They're going to lose money. Bitcoin's a wild, crazy asset class. It does things very strangely. It doesn't work like a traditional currency. Um, however, it will. And I believe in the future what's going to happen is that many, many, many different things will work the same way that the blockchain actually works and that Bitcoin works. Um, but in the future, thanks to innovations like crowdfunding, like peer-to-peer -peer lending, like Bitcoin, what gets funded will reflect the values of society rather than the appetite of governments and banks. So we talked about how money always goes into property because it's banks' favorite asset costs. Well, in the future, people controlling their own money means that they'll be directing flows. And what gets funded will be the reflection of what's on a transparent network and what people want. Um, the second thing is that um, with money also being flowed in the direction that people want it to go, um, the, you know, the, the whole blockchain concept means that in the future, people will be using currencies and asset classes that reflect their values. So rather than if you use Bitcoin, that will be a value choice. If you use US dollars, that will be a value choice. If you use some obscure coin that's being used just for charity, um, that will be a values choice. So I think that in the future, finance is going to get more complicated. There's going to be lots of different currencies, lots of different things going on. 
And the currencies and products that people use are going to be a reflection of their values. And that's really exciting because it brings more personal choice in. What, what are your thoughts on uh, some of these, some of the banks now uh, moving towards cryptocurrency and even uh, announcing that they'll be uh, uh, issuing their own cryptocurrencies? I've got a bit of a, a, a love-hate relationship. It's great for, for Bitcoin and the decentralized cryptocurrencies and blockchains. Uh, because unfortunately, even though banks have committed crime for so long, the world still looks at the banks and trusts them and looks for them for validation. And so this year has been the year where every banker comes out and says, hate Bitcoin, love the blockchain. Um, let me retranslate that for you. What that means is that I thought that Bitcoin was some kind of crazy Ponzi scheme. I didn't get involved and I don't want to lose face. So therefore, if I say I love the blockchain, then I can be involved. Um, is the translation of that, really. <clears throat> um, now, banks getting involved, I think it's great because it adds validation to the technology. Um, it, it helps people get involved more because they're large networks and people are all still using their banks and they trust them even though what's happened over the past. Um, <clears throat> but at the same time, they're creating worse versions of what Bitcoin has already been created. So Citicoin comes out. Um, Citicoin... You know, if you're a consumer and you're looking at, right, how am I going to use my money? Am I going to use a network whereby I own my own money? It's not censored. I can send it um, really easily, really fast, and I don't need to answer questions of everybody um, to, to that. Or am I going to use a coin where every transaction I make, they're going to ask me a ton of questions? Um, and if they decide that they don't like what I'm doing with my money, they're going to take it um, and use some of the properties that we talked about, where they become the legal owner of your cryptocurrency. Um, and they can direct it. If they don't like the way you're directing it, they can spend it as they wish. Um, and now they get involved in the money creation process. So I believe that it's a worst version of what's already been created. But I also think it's good for the sector and blockchains can be used to solve um, more problems add more transparency layers to existing financial systems like, um, you know, securities and, and security transfers. So, yeah, it's a bit of a funny one because when you've been around for the, from, from early on, you, you have this kind of growing pain of being involved in a niche, being involved in what, what you know, and then suddenly it actually gets where you want it to go um, and you lose a bit of the attachment to the niche and suddenly all the banks are getting involved, which um, I would hate for the end result of this entire financial revolution to be that we found a cheaper way of banks committing crime, and that could happen. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this, so there is one thing relating to that is that, of course, you mentioned uh, you know, people would either choose one or the other. Uh, there's the question of consumer protection and ease of use. And if Bitcoin doesn't provide those things, then certainly people would choose the the coin that the bank is issuing because you know people continue to trust banks even though they continue to you know, pr uh, commit crimes as you mentioned so but um so i, I want to ask one more question uh, and then we can mo move on to bank to the future uh, we had uh, david andolfato andolfato on this uh, podcast he's a uh, a VP of research at the St. Louis Fed, and you may have heard he proposed uh, the idea of a Fed coin, where essentially a government would be issuing cryptocurrency uh, under you know his idea of what this would look like. It would look very much like Bitcoin in the sense that it would be uncensored um, with no KYC, and if you take that model, then essentially banks start losing their legitimacy because you can transfer money. Uh, you can transfer this Fed coin without having to go through a bank. Of course, banks are still useful for lending and things like that, but they seriously lose their legitimacy for payment transfer. Um, what do you think of that idea? I, I th I'm all up for, for financial innovation. I don't think it will work. Um, so, you know, I, I guess they're just lending their brand to if it's what works exactly the same as Bitcoin, then that's a very interesting idea. But what does that actually mean? Does that mean that there's um, some kind of deposit insurance? Does it mean that it's not decentralized and there's a central point of failure that hackers can attack? Um, what does it actually mean? So you've you got, you got to dig deeper into um, the details. But if it's simply lending uh, their brand to it, 
then I think it's a good choice. Well, actually, I think the the idea that David talked about it is a super revolutionary and interesting idea, right? The idea that oh, the government now because you you talked about you know money being debt. Well, this wouldn't be debt, right? So all of a sudden, the central bank could could issue in large scale money and. Uh, and you know you wouldn't have to go to the banking system. Wouldn't be this. The, the question is: is the devil's in the detail? When the central banks issue it, um, is it mined into existence? Is it pre-mined? Um, I, I think it know. would just be issue. Uh, yeah, I, I think. Well, to be quite frank, um, personally, I was very, I am very doubtful that this is going to happen. In particular, because the way he talked about it and what he would like would be like an open system that then people can build all kinds of applications on it. And, you know, there's no KYC and it works like Bitcoin in many ways, right? And, and decentrally validated and all. But governments are never going to go for that. I mean, if you look at the license and stuff, there's no way uh, a Federal Reserve would create a cryptocurrency that they don't control, you know, down to the user level. So personally, I, I think it's an interesting concept it's actually a cool concept that would be, uh, it would be good to have that as a competition to Bitcoin along and, and all, but I, I don't think it's going to happen. I think if governments are going to create a cryptocurrency, it is going to be more like you said, right? Where they're going to do KYC on everything and it's going to be a pain and it's going to be uh, full of surveillance and, and things like that. And so all that's done is it's created less security for what what was a very secure idea um and it's also created um you know more risk um into the model so you know regulators have got some interesting challenges ahead um kyc and all these um you know storing documents on a large scale that can be hacked and distributed is not in consumer protection um, at the same time, and it makes it less secure. So the regulations that are meant to be, you know, u- used for consumer protection work in this system completely against what they're originally trying to achieve. So a bank to the future, we have to store details. Um, we have to do KYC. It's part of the um, our requirements in order to operate. Um, but you know what. What that does is it just puts our consumers under an additional risk that we don't want to put them under um, because they're deciding that consumer protection is not as important as their agenda for anti-money laundering and to protect crime. So what they're doing is they're weighing up, is consumer protection more important to us or is anti-money laundering more important to us? Um, And these are all decisions that the governments are going to have to make and decide at the moment, they're deciding that control is more important than consumer protection, um, and they're dressing it up as consumer protection in order to remain control. So, you know, it's very interesting digging deep into these policies and what they're, what they're looking to do. Yeah, so let's talk more about Bank to the Future, the, the company. Uh, so how did you start it, and what was the original idea? So um, Bank to the Future um, was really a, a bottom-up um, entrepreneurial venture that I co-founded with Bliss Dixon um, in 2012. And um, it was just simply a vehicle to get a lot of this innovation funded and moving. Um, we wanted to create a place where um, you know, businesses, funds, um, we could increase more liquidity into the alternative finance sector. Um, so there was things like equity crowdfunding that were coming around. It started in the UK. We had to spend three years lobbying regulators just to allow that to exist. And then America copied it with the Jobs Act um, m- many years later. Um, and so laws are being changed to facilitate this. The reason being is because getting more money into the small to medium sized enterprise and sector has been top of the agenda for governments as a recovery mechanism for the financial crisis. Um, so therefore it's been supported in, in many ways. Um, now Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies are being seen as a, a new sector with a billion pound of venture capital invested in, which is a job creating sector and therefore it's getting more support now. Um, so in a sense for the, for the loss, what we wanted to create is an online investment platform where people that were legally allowed to invest can invest in financial innovation and we've got lots of different products. For example, we raise finance for companies in the alternative finance space. 
Uh, we've raised finance for exchanges. We've raised finance for crowdfunding platforms. We've raised finance for um, people creating alternative banking um, systems. Um, and uh, the existing regulation says that we can only do that with a certain type of investor. But all around the world, rules are changing whereby more and more people can invest um, and they can invest smaller sums. And so uh, we're, we're kind of in the middle of that. So the long answer to a short question is we're an online investment platform that allows um, qualifying investors to kind of hedge the situation, invest in financial innovation, and hopefully build a portfolio that would perform counter to um, how the traditional financial system would perform. So as the financial system gets worse, in theory, um, these investments should perform better. Oh, that's that's fascinating. I wasn't aware of that. So because I saw that, you know, Bank to the Future, you guys do equity crowdfunding and some different things, but I wasn't aware that you specifically look for projects that will do well when the sort of general financial system will do badly. Yeah, so we do fit, we do fintech and financial innovation only, um, and that's that's our niche really. We're we're, we're trying to drive forward, um, you know, many of the changes that we wanted to originally create with government in the original version of Bank to the Future, but luckily the bottom up reforms came along where equity crowdfunding can exist, finance can be raised online, people can use cryptocurrencies to invest. Um, people, you know, the, the internet allows for you to, to reach out to a global audience where it's compliant. Um, and, uh, you know, the blockchain is creating many, many interesting applications that are very disruptive, um, and can potentially be, you know, the next Googles and, and Facebooks in a, in a decentralized way and produce hopefully, um, similar returns for investors in a high risk, high return environment. So you mentioned the Jobs Act, which is changing some of the rules around investment, uh, investing. Um, who can invest today, like on Bank to the Future, and in what countries? Are there restrictions still? Um, so we, we focus on a, on a niche audience. We've got a very niche investor base. So we've got people that really want to invest in fintech, financial innovation. They're wealthy people. They're high net worths. They're sophisticated investors. Um, each country has their own definition. So we've read literally 50 versions of Financial Securities Acts and Services Act and spent lots and lots of money um, on legal fees, compliance. And we've created a structure whereby um, people around the world who are either accredited, professional, sophisticated, and each country has their own definition, um, can invest in these companies and they can build a large portfolio, so they can invest as little as a thousand dollars, which um, you know, in some cases, sometimes it's five hundred dollars. Um, they can invest in any currency that's allowed to operate in a compliant way. Um, they can invest in cryptos. Um, they can invest how they wish um, into companies, and they just have to make sure they're the right type of investor. And every time a regulator releases a new act, such as the Jobs Act that increases the, the ability for people to invest, then our platform will adapt um, and make sure that only the correct people invest. Now, how do you uh, filter those people? Because I mean, so I, we both created accounts on Bank to the Future and we were quite easily able to get into the platform because there's some sort of self-verification or self-checking. Uh, is there further verification of that investor? Uh, yeah, so we, you know, the people have to, check the box, make sure they're the right things. We have quizzes to make sure they can demonstrate they understand it. We have to do um, you know, KYC requirements. We have to get documented evidence when people invest certain levels. Um, and it also depends how they invest. So it's, it's a very simple process on the front end um, for, for people to make sure they're going in the right direction. But we also have products which anyone can, can, can back. For example, you know, people might be simply backing like a Kickstarter project, something that they want to see. And anyone's allowed to do that. Um, the only restrictions are where we can take payments from, but Bitcoin solves those as well. Um, and so you can only get to the place where you're allowed to get to in a compliant way. Um, and yeah, we, we, have to, we have to comply with uh, various other, very, all the financial services acts of the country where the person's resident. It's time for a word from our sponsors, Voltoro.com, the gold to Bitcoin exchange. Now, we all know there's been no shortage of Bitcoin exchange scams and hacks in these recent years. And that's why when Philip 
and Josh, the two brothers behind Voltoro, decided to start that exchange in the wake of the Mount Gox disaster. They wanted to do things differently. So they're really pushing the bar forward and innovating in terms of security, transparency, and auditability to ensure that customer funds are safe, secure, auditable, and so that there's no there's none of this Mount Gox, you know, stuff going on. It's all on the up and up. So if you've been listening to the podcast, of course, you know Voltoro and perhaps you like Voltoro and you like what they do. Well, something new is happening, something really exciting is happening, and that's Voltoro is doing an equity crowdfunding campaign through Bank to the Future of Simon Dixon, who, of course, you know as well by this point. Uh, so if you're interested, you now have the chance of actually owning some equity in a startup, which is sort of a new thing, equity crowdfunding. And not just a startup, but a great Bitcoin startup, a great startup in this space. And you can even invest with Bitcoin. So if you're interested, check it out. That's on Bank to the Future. So BNK to the Future.com. And of course, we'll put a link in the show notes. And we would like to thank Voltura for their support of Epson and Bitcoin and hope they're going to have a fantastic crowdfunding campaign. Tell us about some of the companies that have raised money through Bank to the Future. Um, so we've got we've got a, a number of different models. Um, some some examples are um, the the sponsor of um, this podcast, I believe, Shapeshift. So um, what we did is we invested um, in Shapeshift because we also run a venture capital fund called Bitcoin Capital that raised finance through Bank to the Future, um, and we invested in Shapeshift. Um, and then we have the ability one after we've invested. Um, to allow people to invest in the, the the entity that we set up to hold those shares. Um, so people can get exposure to the venture capital round. So what happens in most cases is people read Coindesk or they read something and they find out, hey, um, Shapeshift has raised $2 million from VCs and there's no way of actually getting involved. Well, with our model, we're getting, because we've got a very high profile in the blockchain cryptocurrency space, we get invited to most of those funding rounds. Um, and so therefore, we can Im- invest a block in those funding rounds and then after the fact, give um, you know other investors that weren't necessarily a venture capitalist or an institution the ability to, to get involved if they're a qualifying investor. So um, you know, that's what we did in the case of Shapeshift. In other circumstances, people are just raising finance direct. Um, so we had one company called Crowd Property, which... Um, I invested in personally as well. I should disclose um, I invest in a lot of these companies myself. So, um, you know, I've got skin in the game as well. Um, And uh, simply he was offering shares um, in taking the crowdfunding concept and applying that to the real estate property markets um, and allowing crowding people back into property, as it were, because everyone's been crowded out because of the price has increased so much because um, banks are issuing loans for property um, as a main asset class, which has pushed up the price, and therefore you need a higher deposit. But now you can crowdfund that together where you can get involved in real estate investing for as little as $500 or so. So if if, if I can just rephrase, uh, so with Bitcoin Capital, what what you did with Shapeshift, so Bitcoin Capital is a VC fund, you funded around in Shapeshift, then those shares, you then put them back onto uh, bank to the future, so that essentially people are funding that VC round. Yeah, so we 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 negotiate with the company, and we say that we'd like to have a reallocation, whereby a certain amount of the allocation um, can be used for pe- our investors on our platform. And if they don't get subscribed, then we'll underwrite it and we'll invest anyway. So that's one model. We've got other models. You can direct, you know, a company can just raise finance without that model. Um, and we also do where, um, for example, um, we run a TV show, which we just, um, we've recorded our first 10 episodes, um, called crowd factor. And the way crowd factor works is a show with Max Kaiser and myself, um, and an entrepreneur can come along and be interviewed live on the show. Um, we'll invest, we won't invest and it will go up on the platform. And if we invest, people can co-invest alongside us as a, as a different, you know, direct investment or a special entity. Um, or we can um, we can not invest, put it on the crowd, and the crowd can prove us wrong and go out and invest in a really successful business that we missed. Um, so think of Shark Tank or Dragon's Den, um, where the crowd gets to prove us wrong if we don't invest and they get another opportunity. So 
you know, we're using financial innovation to, to drive forward different models, produce new liquidity that didn't exist before, and give the investors that are compliantly allowed to invest the opportunity to invest where they didn't have it before. So we're big on capital. I just wanted to describe it in a little bit more detail. Right, The way it works is that you use your own uh, crowdfunding platform, Bank to the Future, to raise money for a fund. And that fund then works a lot like a VC fund, right? In that it, it invests in different startups, specifically in the cryptocurrency space. Actually, it does some other things too, right? Besides investing in startups. But so it's, 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 a, it's, it's, it's I guess, a little bit as if an individual had the opportunity to invest in, in a hedge fund that spe- specific, uh, specifically focuses on the Bitcoin cryptocurrency space. Uh, which is, of course, an asset class that normal people don't have access to. So Bitcoin Capital was a problem that Max Kaiser and myself wanted to solve, which is whenever we go around the world, people ask. Because, I mean, I speak at a lot of the Bitcoin conferences and things like that, but that's not my favorite audience. My favorite audience is people that haven't used Bitcoin yet, that are skeptical about Bitcoin. And I spend a lot of my time, you know, trying to convert people into the benefits of being involved in this sector um, and and what it actually is. So I I, I frequently get asked by professional investors, high net worth people, you know, hey, you know, that was interesting. That changed my perception of what it is, but how can I actually get involved? Um, And then we go down this whole thing of, well, you've got to open a wallet and you've got to do this and you've got to do that. Um, and then you've got to convert on an exchange that you don't trust and stuff like that. And, you know, the whole rabbit hole of because this is an early sector, it's not terribly easy for everyone to use yet. Um, so Bitcoin Capital was a, a way for them to just simply put their fiat money in. Um, and we run a venture capital fund that also pays them Bitcoin so that they can start using them. And so what we wanted to do is um, we wanted to use one third of the funds to invest in a process that we use. So we have mining rigs in Iceland um, and we've got a very lean um, model that's still profitable for mining bitcoins and altcoins and other coins and all the others, whatever's most profitable at the time. Um, So what we do is we invest a third of their funds in that process and we give them daily dividends every day paid for in bitcoin. Um, which means that they accumulate their Bitcoins in an environment where it's not like a traditional miner, where they have to sell their Bitcoins in order to pay for their electricity. These are longer term investors that want to accumulate their Bitcoins and then use them for the first time and start getting involved in, in, in the sector. The other third we use to just hold positions in coins. Very few coins. Um, we've only got two positions at the moment in coins that we believe in. Um, and can, can you share what those are? So we've invested in Bitcoin and Starcoin. We hold positions in those. Starcoin is a crowdfunding altcoin, very high risk, um, very volatile coin. But it was designed specifically with the user case of um, being used for crowdfunding to help businesses get funded and to give people money. It was a pre-mine coin where we give people their first investment for free on the platform. Um, and uh, it's used for crowdfunding. So we think that's an interesting case. Um, and uh, we're, we're looking at others, but we're, we're very, you know, we're, we're, we're looking, we've been more, mostly investing in the longer term asset class of venture capital, which is we've got a portfolio of companies. We've invested in BitReserve. We've invested in Shapeshift. We've invested in Factum. Um, we've invested in some others that we're due to announce as well. And so the idea of the fund was as follows. It gives you exposure to the growth of the Bitcoin and blockchain sector. It allows people to invest in a way that they're traditionally used to. They don't have to be a Bitcoin geek to get involved. Um, We'll pay you Bitcoins for as long as the mining process is profitable. They'll diminish over time. Um, And at that point, we might convert to some other type of coin, whatever it is, whatever's profitable. But eventually, it won't be profitable. So you'll accumulate a position. And you'll get short-term dividends while the long-term venture capital takes time to mature because that's normally a five to seven year time frame in order for one of these companies to float on a stock market or float on what might be a Bitcoin blockchain market in the future or um, get bought by another company. And uh, you 
the high risk, high return asset class that it is. Now, with Bitcoin Capital, are, are you going to provide other services to the companies you invest in? I'm thinking, for, in, for instance, mentorship, and things like that. So we're, we're very active in the companies we invest in. Um, you know, Max Kaiser's involved and he's got a very, a very, very large following in the sector. So where it's a good fit, um, you, can, you might be able to go on his show and discuss your business, um, you know, conflicts of interest aside, um, whatever the right thing to do is there. That's his decision um, and the TV channel's decision. Um, but we, um, our, our, our main niche is marketing. So we talk everywhere around the world about all the businesses we've invested in, like we're doing right now. Um, we have, you know, very. I have a large investor following. Bank to the Future has a large investor base. We would like to combine it with crowdfunding purely. So, you know, for example, Factum, they've now got three hundred and five new investors that help them raise their million plus dollars on Bank to the Future. Um, that's 300 investors that are all advocates, all looking to support, promote the business. Um, and we talk about it wherever we go. And we also co-invest with other larger investors. You might know some of the things like Barry Silbert and Pantera Capital we've co-invested with. Some of, the, some of the people that most people are looking to try and get involved because we're all out there advocating and we're all looking to bring some added value and put these companies together as well to try and construct some joint ventures um, and share the market share that they're gaining. Um, one thing I wanted to ask about, so with VC funds, uh, there's this typical uh, sort of uh, fund, it's definitely a fee structure, right? Where the, the VC fund might take like 2% per year of the total funds and, and then 20%, for example, of, of all the profits being made. Now, I get this isn't a typical VC fund, right? It's quite different. Um, but how does that work in this case? So the way that we structure Bitcoin Capital is we brought a load of assets to the table when we first started, which is that we were running mining farms for a, a long time. Um, we have the ability to scale up the mining very fast, very slow. And so therefore, we set it up as a traditional company rather than a pure fund where the investors are getting equity in the company and the company is, um, getting, is accumulating assets and the value of those assets pays out dividends um, according to the allocation of the equity. Um, so it's not run in a traditional fund way because it's just not a traditional fund. We have other products which are traditional funds. So we've got one like... Uh, we launched what we call a stock coin mining backed security um, that purely invests just as a fund in the mining process for stock coins. So, so let me jump in here because I saw you mentioned that 50% of the dividends are, are paid out uh, to the investor. So uh, does that mean of, of the initial funding that uh, money that bought all those assets, uh, did you guys put in some of your own money? Or is, is those 50% sort of purely for the fund management and, and all the work you guys are doing and the traveling and the, the marketing, and et cetera? Uh, so, yeah, so, to, so yes, we, we put money in as well. Um, that those, those farms were set up in order to leverage those. So it's, it's like a traditional company. The founders have set stuff up, um, got some assets in the company, and then investors come in at a later stage. Um, and, uh, yeah. And so the, the way that it actually works with the fee structure is 25% goes to, um, a company called Starkcoin Holdings, which is owned by one of the shareholders is Max Geyser, um, who's one of the co-founders of the fund and myself, I get 25% as uh, the fund manager. Okay, cool. And now another thing is that there was a Bitcoin Capital Fund number one, and then there's a fund number two that I think is currently uh, raising money. Can you talk about what's the difference here? How do those two work? There are two, two entities that do exactly the same thing. So when Tranche One is fully invested and it's, um, it's accumulated all of its assets, um, then Tranche Two will, is a completely separate entity that invests in companies and does the same thing. Um, so the, they're, they're complete, they own completely different assets um, and they're completely separate entities. So many people have invested in both. Now, what happens when, because this has been the case for some companies, when the, the, it gets over, the, the funding uh, threshold gets reached and even surpassed? 
with Bitcoin Capital, we're raising a maximum of $5 million in tranche two. So we will close it. There's no overfunding. Um, in other businesses on our platform, you can raise more than your initial goal. Um, and what that means is that you just end up selling more equity. You don't dilute investors. It just okay. means that let's say you wanted to raise a million and you're offering 10% equity. If you end up raising 2 million, you're selling 20% of the company. And I suppose that gets defined in the terms uh, when you first set up the the funding on the site. Uh, yeah, so every investor, as they come in and invest, they, they sign up to an agreement um, and the terms are all outlined on the pitch and each pitch has their own terms. But yeah, there's no... you you. If we raise more on the platform, the investor is never going to get diluted. It means the company is selling more equity. Fantastic. Well, uh, Simon, I think we're, we're sort of at the, at the end of our show, but uh, thanks so much for coming on and talking about it. It was, it was very interesting. Of course, we will put links uh, in the show notes to Bank to the Future, to your book, uh, also to uh, the site where, where Tranche 2 is being raised, right? So if people are interested in, in getting invested there, they can, they can check that out. Okay, well, thank you very much for having me. And I think what you guys are doing is really valuable work because this is a, a sector that needs so much education. Um, I believe it's going to have such a big impact in the future. Um, and any resource like this that's um, helping people get involved, access to information, um, I think is just a tremendously important thing. So keep up the good work and thanks for having me. Thank you. Well, thanks so much. Well, uh, you know, it's... <laughs> Speaking of, of all of Simon's uh, nice praise, we, we have started this bribing contest, which is if you leave an iTunes review, then uh, we will send you a t-shirt like this. Uh, you just need to email us at show at epicenterbitcoin.com with a link to review. You can say as nice things as Simon, or you can say evil things. You get a t-shirt in any case. Um, oh, it's, it's, so it's a... It's a draw, right? So one t-shirt a week. It's a draw, a actually. It's one, yeah. one t-shirt a week. So if... if uh, hundreds of you rush to this opportunity, then, uh, well, it will be a lottery just like Bitcoin mining is. Uh, <laughs> so thanks so much for joining us this week. So we put out new episodes of Epicenter of Bitcoin every Monday. Uh, you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, SoundCloud, or your favorite podcast app. And we're also, by the way, we're also on TuneIn now. So TuneIn. For those, yes. Okay, I haven't a new, heard of that. It's a new platform. It's important to, I, I guess it's a new thing. It's important to mention it, I, I've heard. Okay, so we're also on the new thing called TuneIn. And of course, we're on the old thing where you can watch video called YouTube. And that's on <laughs> youtube.com slash Uh So thanks so much. And we look forward to being back next week. Thank you.